Happy Saturday morning and welcome to another episode of Collider Mailbag on this Comic-Con weekend. I am not down there partaking in the festivities or cosplaying or enjoying the panels because I'm at a wedding in Portland, Oregon as I record this. Uh, but I knew I had to bring another power heavy hitter who also isn't going down there uh, and had his Saturday to come on with me. And that's Jeff Snyder. How are you, Jeff? Hey, everybody. Good to be back <laughs> up here at Collider Video. <laughs> I like it when you make fun. Okay, Jeff's our scoops guy here. You've broken some scoops recently. You had some casting news. Big stuff going on. Uh, what's the one? Do you have one you can kind of say that you have your eye on or no? No. Yeah, it's perfect. I, I love my, it. My rivals watch these shows. Oh, do they really? Yeah, to try oh. to get insight into this this mind. Well, hello, Boris. Got a lot hello, uh, what's the other guy? That other guy. <laughs> I always like to make fun of him. Kroll. All right, let's, uh, you guys know how the Collider Mailbag works. We get questions from you, the fans. You send them in. I pick out about 20. Send them on to my guest. My guest picks about five that they really want to talk about and are excited to talk about. And this week was no different. We get five really great questions to talk about. When we put the calls out on social media, make sure you look for that hashtag collider mailbag and put that hashtag on your question so i can find it easier and if you don't want to do social media you can always email us at mailbag at collider.com that's mailbag at collider.com all right jeff you ready let's do it baby let's do it all right our first question is a twitter question that comes from nikki at black cat underscore 365 whoa is the dark universe dead will other studios like blumhouse take a crack at this monster universe they tried to build jeff snyder uh, is the dark universe dead? That is a good question. Yeah. The universe itself may be dead, or at least the universe that we were pitched, where mm -hmm. it had like the group photo with all the actors in it. And yeah, I don't know that we'll ever get to see like Johnny Depp or Javier Bardem right. or, you know, whoever it is. I mean, I think that. You know, uh, Universal sort of learned from the mummy, from the mummy that you kind of need to make one good movie first. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mummy certainly was bad, and that Dracula Untold or whatever one with Luke Evans that yeah. was bad too. Um, I think that they're trying to do it with with the Invisible Man. You know, like I mean, that is Blumhouse. Yeah, Blumhouse is smaller. making that movie. Yeah. Uh, I think if that movie is good, could we see the Invisible Man or some of those characters in other classic monster movies? Yes. I think the key to it really is Van Helsing. Yeah. And there have been oh. a lot of rumors that Tom Hardy could be playing Van Helsing. Oh, that boy. Universal's trying to get him because then you have you know uh, a, a monster hunter who's hunting all these different people. I don't know that you care about a Bride of Frankenstein movie without a Frankenstein movie. You mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. So what I mean, what? youth make of all this and I, I if you're gonna go anywhere blumhouse is the way to go they've certainly shown that they can work in uh higher uh, budgets and lower budgets and have good results for the most part in their work so and they're certainly they're certainly now the premier horror film studio that people look forward to seeing their movies from so you look at this idea certainly what well, we talk about invisible man blumhouse is doing it jason blum has said that they're doing a smaller version of in invisible man and right. that's what these films were i think trying to go big with you create this massive universe is an incredible mistake in, in now looking back in retrospect because these films uh, got into our hearts because they're small kind of independent feeling films it's certainly the same sets were probably used for some of these films so they were basically churned out by the studio and there were multiple iterations of each character they got crazier and crazier and crazier don't try to revere this thing with Abbott and Costello met the Wolfman I mean that's those are those kinds of fun things you could have with this universe so I think Blumhouse can do that and Jason was asked in a Twitter AMA recently whether he would be willing to take control of the dark universe and he said emphatically yes with four exclamation points so this is where you want to go and Kurtzman says who worked on the mummy you know he did the mummy he said I took too many cues from the studio so and that's them trying to create something because Marvel did something too many people tried to create what Marvel did with their properties and they end up crashing their ships on the rocks I think part of it is just that horror is a genre that doesn't need stars. Right, good and point. And these monsters are supposed to be the stars, and there was too much emphasis on stars in the original iteration of the Dark Universe. Right. Now with Invisible Man, I mean, it, the, the lead character, who may not be the lead in the movie, but like the title character at least, sorry, mm -hmm. is being played by Oliver Jackson Cohen, who, you know, is not a big star. He's from uh, Haunting at Hill, on, uh, of Hill House. Right. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think that they found the right filmmaker in Lee Winnell. I don't know that Kurtzman yeah was was the right guy for the mummy um yeah um, um I, I think that there's potential there but let's take it one film at a time i agree with you all right what's our next question Jeff? our next question is number two michael cannon from at artil don artil yep. don 
while it is a travesty not to give Henry Cavill another shot at Superman, what other actor would you be okay with taking over the role? Ben Affleck. No, I'm joking. The This has been asked a few times. I wanted to get Jeff's point of view on it. My standard answers are still there. Jamie Dorner is an interesting choice. Matt Bomber. I've always uh, stumped for Matt Bomber. Army Hammer. Now that Batman is out of the mix, Army Hammer Superman becomes very interesting to me. And Ben Barnes is kind of my closet favorite coming out of uh, The Punisher and what he's able to do. These are the choices I have in my head, but some people have been putting out Michael B. Jordan. Uh, these unusual choices. Tyler uh, Hawkland, I think, coming out of Supergirl. So, so many people have great ways to go. I think we got to see now with Pattinson, with Gal Gadot, with Jason Momoa, you got to go younger here. Cavill radiated kind of older, so you got to have to go a little bit younger here. And what's the size and the body type you're looking for? I think that will matter as well. What do you think, Joe? I think Bomer <clears throat> is wrong okay. for it, and Barnes is a bit of a stretch. But I like where your head's at with regard to Army Hammer mm. and even Jamie Dornan. Um, I, I could, I could, Dornan, sorry, yeah, yeah, I could see Jamie Dornan. But my pick is uh, kind of unconventional as well. Um, I might go with Blake Jenner. What? Really? Yeah. What an interesting choice. He's kind of got that strong jaw, like the little like dimple mm -hmm. like in his chin. And I could also see him <laughs> as Clark Kent. He slapped a pair of John Roca glasses on him. You know, he looks like a reporter. I don't know. There's something about Blake Jenner that has impressed me in Everybody Wants Some in American yeah. Animals. Did sure. you see that one yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did watch uh, it. You know, I, I think that he has... He, he has a, like a little anger inside him, mm -hmm. but but he's, he can also be very charming and he's good looking. I don't I don't know. I, I, I like Blake Jenner. I'm surprised you haven't thrown Zac Efron into the mix. No, you were Zac, such a supporter. Zac of him Efron Batman. is a little too small to play Superman. I understand that. I did think of him, but he is not the answer. No. What do you think about the Michael B. Jordan stuff? Would we be able to, I mean, would we be okay as a society with a black Superman? Yeah, no, I think that there's, I have no problem with a black Superman. Mm -hmm. I, I think black B Batman is actually a tougher sell. Okay. Um, I, so, I mean, Michael B. Jordan would be a great call. He's sort of been in a couple of comic book movies already, and mm -hmm. I don't know if he, if, you know, if he just Good wants point. to, like, keep doing these types of movies. I, I just don't know what the upside is for him. Right. Um, you know, because he's got big shoes to fill with mm -hmm. Christopher Reeve and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would like the idea of a Latino Superman. And by that, I, because I mean like the idea of being an alien and then coming, like there's all kinds of subtext and levels you can play with if you were to cast a young, strong Latino actor who can carry the idea of Clark Kent into the world it would be fantastic. Who would that idea. be? Like, I don't know yet. I haven't seen him yet. Jay Hernandez, too old? Uh, yeah, too old and doesn't have that gravitas. Jay doesn't have that gravitas. What do you, you make know? of uh, Gabriel Luna from <clears throat> Terminator Dark Fate? Uh, Luna? Cause, cause Wait he's a minute. Because he's up and coming. Luna's a possibility. I like what I've seen so far in the trailer. I mean, obviously, we haven't seen the movie. but It couldn't be like Diego Luna. It couldn't be Guy no. Garcia Bernal. No, no, no. Not no. those standard ones. No. no. Oscar Isaac would have been a possibility so, but maybe a few years ago. Not now. Um, I think there's someone out there that could do that and radiate that so who's sitting around waiting like Hemsworth was before they tapped him for Thor. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you can't tell me there isn't a wealth of Latino actors and acting classes right down the street here in Los Angeles who could probably do a fantastic Superman. So, you know, that just would an be, idea. That, that would be interesting. I like what you're saying, uh, talking about playing with, like, aliens. And, right, and, illegal and aliens, that aliens, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's move on to our third question. It's a Twitter question from at finders keepers uh, with a three and a uh, capital I there seeing what happened recently with crawl is it possible that the fear of press and critics responses cause studios to act in a way in which small movies get less attention than they deserve Jeff that's a that's a tricky question um, okay. the fear of press and critics you know I mean I think so I think yes but the, the old adage is that nobody knows anything, mm -hmm. right, in Hollywood, and that's true of marketing folks as well. Like, to me, the press will never hurt you because movies all the time get terrible reviews and they open to $100 million, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It, it, people, critics, I don't think, can change people's minds. If they want to see something, they're going to see it. But what a critic can do is convince someone who's on the fence about seeing something to see it, you yeah. know? Like, I just don't understand why Paramount didn't screen crawl for critics mm -hmm. i don't understand the industry's infatuation with junket press these days um and okay. why and why the industry caters to junket press first and foremost um mm -hmm. 
I just, uh, you know, I, the whole incident is, is head scratching. From what I understand of Crawl specifically, though, the, the the marketing team at Paramount did not know what it had on its yep. hands. Yep. I mean, I asked to see Crawl at the end of May when it first started screening for some industry friends of mine, and they said this movie's awesome. And I didn't even like believe them at first. Yeah. And I was, you know, uh, you know, harping on Paramount. When can I see this movie? When can I see this movie? And they never showed it. And it's like, okay, I mean, I'm not the bad guy here. I'm right. just here to help you sell your movie. So I don't understand the, the thinking from marketing or, or publicity on that title. Yeah, it's a fascinating situation with Crawl because you got Sam Raimi and Alexandra Ja, and you, you're putting them together into a film. And you think that's going to sell it to the horror community. But no, you still need to do the marketing. You still need to do the pre-screening. And if, if you, even if you have a terrible horror film, not screening it for critics is a massive mistake because a lot of horror fans go in spite of the critics critics uh, saying negative things about their horror films because they want to see for themselves if it's good or not to not screen it at all doesn't allow for critics to glowingly talk about the film just in case you take the chances uh, and I think you should as a studio especially with a smaller film like this I mean Kaya Scudelario was not bringing people into seats Barry Pepper it was not bringing people right. into seats so it had you had to rely on the critics in a, in a good marketing campaign an underground marketing campaign that doesn't that at this point uh, doesn't grab the attention of people to get them into the theaters then you have to go all the way back and blame uh, Paramount with the way they approach this thing and not knowing what you have is a terrible thing uh, to, to hear from a marketing department with a movie right I, I just you know I don't think um, um, I'm like blanking on, on the point that I wanted to make yep. I just I'm, bl I'm blanking Hold on, I, ha I had a point. Okay, I, well, I, let I me keep, let me throw in another try. thing here, and that is that AMC is doing this thing uh, with this uh, program with artisanal films, right? They're trying to promote these films that so they can stay longer in the theaters. So something like Booksmart, they're launching this because of what happened with that film. Crawl, you can throw into that mix as well. Crawl didn't get reviewed, but got glowingly reviewed after it was released. You can force, or uh, the, the, this artisanal program is to keep certain films in theaters longer so that they can be found by the audiences after they've exhausted doing the blockbuster superhero thing. I know what I wanted to say. Yeah. Said, I, don't, I don't actually agree with you that, that studios shouldn't, like, it's okay for studios to say we're not screening this title for press. Okay. You know, like, I don't know why. I don't think it's okay. Why does okay. Lionsgate need to, 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 to show me Saw 5, you know, and, and open themselves up for that? Because, like, I, I think you're seeing Saw 5 regardless of, you know, the reviews or not, if you're a genre fan. I just think Paramount left millions on the table with this particular opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like, this could have been The Shallows, like that movie that's either, yeah. That, yeah. That's either a, you know, a blast of fresh air uh, that doesn't take itself too seriously um, you know, or, or, or something that's just like a fun B movie, mm -hmm. you know, a popcorn movie. I think that's what I tweeted and Barry Pepper uh, said that's all that they were trying to make. And so mm -hmm. I, th I think it's a bummer for those filmmakers and, and the people who worked on that movie that Paramount didn't believe in it more. Yeah, and we'll see what happens because you look at a film like Yesterday, that thing got $80 million. And they, rele they released it ahead of time. Right now, worldwide, $80 million. They released it ahead of time. They weren't. They didn't know what they were gonna. What the reception was gonna be. I think you always have to screen it. I think you do. I get that you don't think you have to, but I think you do just in case. A small, especially small films, because you want them to get some kind of buzz to get people behind it. I mean, uh, John Wick, uh, Weinstein didn't even want to screen it for critics, and eventually was forced to. Did it, and look at the uh, the franchise we have now. So uh, it's an opportunity lost, and a number of films this year have had an opportunity lost. And I wonder what it's going to lead to in the future. Maybe marketing teams are under understanding what to do uh, going forward with these lessons here. Uh, all right, what's our next question, Jeff? All right, the next question is from Bui Buddha. He gets it on again. Wow. Yeah. No. Uh, with the streaming wars going on, what streaming service will you keep or get if you were only allowed to have one? If you could add any features to it, what would you want? Also, what is the must-have feature of a streaming service in your opinion? All right, so I got a lot of thoughts here. Obviously, Netflix is it's my a good question. Yeah, it is. And um, Netflix is, is my default choice. However, Disney Plus is coming on, and I want to see what Disney Plus has to offer once that service opens up right now. So I can't tell you which one I'm going to have. I was going to choose one right now because there's only, what, two or three? Hulu, uh, uh, Amazon, and uh, Netflix. So there's not that many out just yet. DC Universe, to me, doesn't really count. But So you throw this mix in with Disney Plus. I want to see what they have. 
I'd like a host of a of a highlight uh, of a show on that streaming service that highlights certain films and does certain reviews of those films that get you excited about watching that film. That I'd be all about. Um, I think a clear cataloging of what's new on the site and when it's leaving is really important. They just started doing that recently with Dairy Girls. They re they say right there when you go to the uh, uh, Netflix when you go and see, it says the second season August second. Everything should say leaving this date or coming this date new season comes this date blah 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 because then it gets you excited it gets you pumped to see the show or you or, or let you know to see it before it leaves i think they should have an option where you can hide auto playing the trailers there's nothing more annoying than skimming through to see what you want to watch and if you stay too long to read what the hell this film's about all of a sudden the trailer starts with loud noises loud music loud talking that throws you off what you're reading that's such a massive mistake you should be able to and the last thing i think is i would like them to have commentary for the films and the TV shows that were originally recorded for these DVD or Blu-ray releases uh, and have them incorporated as an option for you to watch it again with the commentary. That would be cool, yeah. Like if Netflix offered commentary yeah, tracks for right? some of its original like movies. Like Kieran Kubrick talk about, or Coppola, or any of the big and filmmakers. I'm with you on the auto-playing trailers. That is a nightmare. Oh. I, they got to figure that out. That's yeah. bad. Um, and I, and I, I agree with you that it, it is tricky. You, you want to know what you can watch and when you can watch it. When are things coming to the service? When are they leaving? Right. I think that they need to, need to have a release calendar tab at the top of Netflix. Great point. Playing. Here's the release calendar. Yep. Um, but okay. I mean, you kind of you kind of didn't answer the question. Oh, I he, didn't. He didn't answer the question, I folks. said Netflix, but I got to see you, what Netflix, Disney yeah, Plus releases. You said you kind of couldn't choose. But okay. I'm, I'm choosing, and I'm going to go with Netflix okay. because it's committed to adult programming. I mean, if I had kids... You know, I, I could see where Disney Plus would be the easy answer mm -hmm, here because mm -hmm. you just want to be able to plop the kids down uh, in front of the TV and take a nap, probably. Right. Um, but Netflix just has, you know, so many interesting creators they're in business with. Budget doesn't seem to matter. Not that I'm a stockholder, so it's like, what do, what do I care if they spend, you know, overspend on comedy specials or right. whatever? I think that they have just really great technology. I think that the Bandersnatch thing is really cool mm -hmm. um some of the interactivity that they offer and i just like this smooth user experience like uh, i know it's it can be tough to find movies on netflix sometimes but i don't know i like my cue and uh i li like some of the categories that they have and it's just i don't know everything flows a little bit easier than maybe say something on like hulu yeah 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 i agree with that uh i think hulu and amazon prime haven't quite caught up to the look of Netflix, especially Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime is kind of boring. It's essentially like a microfiche in rows and rows of things. Right. And you don't get that kind of more dynamic approach that Netflix has. I think if they upgraded the, their approach, their look of their streaming service, that would attract more attention, the, to be honest with you. That spotlight that Netflix has is really powerful. Yeah. Like when you can put one title you know, on the on the home screen of, mm -hmm. of 125 million accounts. So when they turn the TV on, they see that image. It's, yeah, that's pretty uh, crazy. Yeah. Um, Amazon. Yeah, I, I just don't. I, for me, that's like a content issue where I like, you know, I don't really watch that many Amazon shows. Hulu, I actually, I, you know, they have some good originals. Don't get me wrong, but oh, they yeah. don't have enough. I agree. So I use Hulu as a TV service where I'm watching. I'm waiting until maybe midnight to watch SVU or the Goldbergs, like right. my favorite broadcast shows that don't appear on Hulu until the next day, which is technically midnight. Yeah. Those sound like your shows. All right. Uh, let's go to our <laughs> last question. And that is from uh, Carter's Reviews. He asks, hey, outlaw and awesome guest. Uh, if you were in charge of rebooting Breakfast Club, not saying you should, who would you cast? I think Maya Hawk as Claire and Joe Keery as Andrew would be a solid start. Stay sweaty. Have a great day, Jeff. Snyder. I like those picks. I mean, I you too. know, they had great chemistry in Stranger Things. I could, I could certainly see it. Um, but I didn't go with that. Okay. And I also think that I think you need a black character in the Breakfast Club these days. Okay. And I think that. Oh, you mean a black actor? Or a black character? A black character. Well, black actor, a black character. You need the black actor would play one of the standard characters from the original yes, film, right? Okay, okay. okay. Sure. <laughs> you need a black actor. Well, because black character, you're essentially saying you want a new character in The Breakfast Club. I see what you mean. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think Andrew is the natural one to make an mm, African-American. Okay. Um, so I, I think I might cast Kelvin Harrison as Andrew. Okay. Just like a guy who looks, you know, uh, very kind of preppy and, and like a, mm -hmm. a, a good guy, a leader, but like maybe has a darker side where he, you know, played that prank that, that landed sure. him there. Sure. Um, Bender. Bender's a tough one. Man. Yeah. 
Wait, wait, wait. Let's go character by character. Yeah, who did, who did you? Who did you have as Andrew? Oh, yeah. Andrew as Andy. You can't look. So uh, yeah. Cody Christian from Teen Wolf. I liked him as Andy. I don't even know who that is. Oh my God, well, he's a good-looking Co dude. Cody he's, Christian. Yeah, yeah. He's on. He's on Teen Wolf. A lead in Teen Wolf. I like the way he looks. He's a good look for Andy as a as a jock. Okay, white guy. Yes. Okay. I tried to stay under twenty five with all these choices. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Um, all right, Bender. Uh, I had two choices here. Okay. I did Will Poulter. Ooh, nice choice. I like Poulter. Uh, you know, or or Emery Cohen, who just I have I've always had a soft spot for Emery okay. Cohen. I like when he kind of plays the tough guy. Okay. Um, you? Uh, I have as Bender Lucas Hedges. Yeah. Okay. After mid nineties, where he was like the the abusive like, yeah, older brother, the yeah. kind of aggressive. I could see that. Right? I could definitely see that. He's got that anger ever since Moonrise Kingdom getting stabbed in the back with those scissors. He's had that anger going through. So I could see him playing the Bender character. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll give you that. He's got that bully aspect to him within him. Uh, Kate, I had Caitlin Deaver as Allison from uh, Booksmart. Okay. I just think she's a very talented uh, actress, and that's a tricky part because it it's very like kind of nonverbal to start. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she's interesting. I was I took the recently Emmy nominated Joey King as Allison. Yeah, right. I like it. You got some good choices Thank here, Roka. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, that that Emmy nomination super well deserved. I yeah. love. Did you watch the act? I, I no, I haven't seen it yet, but her reaction on Twitter was incredible. It was, if, you, it, if you haven't watched that video of her yeah, getting the call while she's talking to her mom. It's fantastic. That's yeah. honesty, you know? Um, okay, okay. Claire. Claire. Claire was tricky. Claire was tough. I don't know. Because um, Molly Ringwald was just so perfect she for really that was. time. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what to do here, so I went with uh, an up-and-coming talent. I'm okay. taking a flyer on her. I'm going to go with Thomas and McKenzie. Okay. Oh, wow. From uh, 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 the... the, the Ben Foster movie, right? Leave No Trace. Leave No Trace, yes. And she's in Edgar Wright's new movie, and she's got yeah. some exciting things coming up. So uh, I think that she's just a, you know, a rising star in this I business. I like her. Well, I wanted to pick a Claire with a little bit more edge, so uh, who might have a little back and forth. Because in 2019, you're not going to get away with doing some of the things that Bender did to Claire oh, in God. the 80s, yeah, right? No. Wow. And, and Molly Ringwald has spoken about it, even wrote that article about it. So I throw in Peyton List. I like Peyton List Man, as you Claire. Skew. You watch what? much younger entertainment than I do. <laughs> I mean, if Peyton List, no, I mean, all due respect. She's in Cobra Kai she season two. If she walked into the, the front door right now, I would have no idea who it was. Wow, she has over a million followers, I know, man. She, I, I know the name. Okay. I know that she's a famous person. She is a positive, and okay. she's also a positive role model for women. So having her play, for young women rather, having her play that part as Claire would be very interesting. All right. I mean, listen, you may not know, know this guy. So okay. it's like we both have kind of eclectic tastes. Uh, as Brian, yeah. I'm gonna choose Angus Imry, who is in the Ooh. kid, the kid who would be king. He played Merlin. He was our up and comer oh, of the month yeah. here at Collider. Just like you know, a kind of skinny guy, kind of. A, I don't mm. know if I'd call him a weakling, but uh, no, no. you know, he, he radiated that kind of intelligence that Anthony Michael Hall had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that depth. I like that choice. I went a little close to looking like Anthony Michael Hall a little bit. I went with Thomas Brody Sangster, the kid from Love Actually and Game of Thrones. I think he could play a great Brian, and you could see him crying. You could see him going to, Claire, what are you going to, Claire? He's going to ignore me, Claire. You're going to ignore us on Monday morning. And you could see that happening overall. So I like that uh, aspect of it. And I threw a curveball in here for uh, uh, Ed Vernon. I like Dylan McDermott as Vernon, as, pr as Vice Principal I like Vernon. that. I could see that. Right? Oh, you could, you could see, see him going the two and two. The two and two. You I, had, I it. had Michael Shannon or... <laughs> Or David Harbour. Oh, uh, oh, well, Harbour's kind of an easy choice. I tried to skew away from Stranger Things. I could have like polluted yeah. the whole thing with Stranger Things. You're right. Really. So I tried to uh, move away from it, even though they were great suggestions for, by uh, by uh, Carter's reviews yeah. here. Joe Keery could have been, honestly, he could have been any of the guys. Yeah. <laughs> he could have been oh, all what? three. Yeah, depending on <laughs> what stage Bender, of his career he was could've in. Could have been Brian. Absolutely. Um, well, guys, let me know whose cast you like more. Yeah. Uh, I have <laughs> Kelvin Harrison Jr., Will Poulter, Emery Cohen, Caitlin Deaver, Thomas McKenzie, Angus Emery. All right, I got a Cody Christian, Joey King, Thomas Brody Sangster, Lucas Hedges, and Peyton List. Yeah, as um, did, Claire. Now wait, we're forgetting one character. Who was that? Murray? No, Carl. Carl, right? Who the, is uh, the eyes and ears of this <laughs> institution, my friends? You know who I cast as Carl? Jeff Snyder. Jeff Snyder is Guys, a perfect. Hit, call. hit me up. I'll do, get you my headshot. Uh, I actually wanted to go with David Dasmalkian.
Oh, Dust Monkey's great. Yeah, I think he'd, he'd be kind very of be a, funny. An interesting little weirdo. Yeah, that's a great choice, um, actually. Yeah, that was a fun question. Right. Breakfast Club, what a classic. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Yeah, definitely. All right, thanks everybody for watching this episode of Collider Mailbag on this wonderful Saturday morning here on this Comic Con weekend. Listen, we are not the only uh, game in town on the Collider channel. There's a lot of coverage here on Collider for Comic Con. Make sure after you watch this episode, you go and watch all of the coverage. They're doing trailers and what have you, everything. I'm going to be in Portland enjoying a wedding, but everyone else is covering this stuff. So do yourself a favor and watch it and get some points of views from some of your favorite Collider personalities on everything that's having at Comic-Con this weekend. I want to thank Jeff Snyder for taking the time to stop by. Thank so you. that's Peyton List. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Look up Cody Christian now, you fool. <laughs> uh, Mr. Up-and-Comer over here. I'm at the end Snyder on Twitter, on Instagram, and uh, you can also uh, check me out on Cameo. Book a Cameo. There you go. I just got my first Cameo request. I haven't even filled out my intro yet. I got a Cameo request this week. How you, how you like that? Uh, you can find me there as well. Uh, you can fo also follow me at the Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Don't forget... Uh, to put the when you're sending in your questions here for future episodes, put that hashtag Collider Mailbag on it when we put the call out on social media or email us at mailbag at collider.com. Thanks to Cody in the booth over there. And also tomorrow, a new episode of Collider Mailbag drops with the wonderful Mark Riley. Until then, have yourself a great Saturday. Two months, Roka. Two months. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? <laughs>